Several years ago, I was in a college admissions office, not trying to get into school, but actually visiting with one of my daughters as we were uh, trying to select, she was trying to select a school, and we end up at the University of North Carolina, the old Chapel Hill, Tar Heels over there. And it was crazy. I, we had been to a bunch of schools, uh, didn't end up going there, but I was fascinated by something the admissions counselor said to us, something different than everybody else said. I'll tell you what that is in just a second. Welcome to Chasing Greatness. That's what we're doing this week. And I hope you're having a great week. You're really trying to get after it and maximize your potential. Remember, we said greatness is not about can we be great. What makes us great is when we help others be great, when we learn to serve. We, we talk about some of the things that actually Jesus talked about, I think is a pretty cool definition where he said, the ones who want to be great need to be servants. They need to be the ones who are really least, and they have this deep humility they have this willingness to help and share generous spirit. I think that's fantastic. And so I hope that's what where we find you today. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hang out with you these next few minutes. I got one of my coaches that's going to show up today, Chuck Cusimano, who's he's a great friend and a fantastic business leader. You'll learn some things from his story on this topic that we're talking about with what I heard when I was at this this University of North Carolina admissions office. So let me let me tell you about this day. This is crazy. This lady stands up and she says, I know you're very impressive kids. You've got these great resumes. I mean, can you imagine these days all these kids trying to get into school? It, it really is impressive. Their <laughs> resumes, their accomplishments, it's, it's just nuts. I don't think I could get into uh, – to college these days. I'm not sure I could anyway. It was it was hard enough back in the day, but today it's just so competitive. Everything's crazy. And this lady says, I, I got uh, bad news for you. If you are a well-rounded kid, you're in the wrong room. We're not looking for well-rounded people. She says, we're looking for pointed people. And I'm like, whoa, that's new. She says, we want people to come here who really want to be a specialist, who want to impact the world in their own specific, unique way. Now, that was pretty interesting to hear her talk that way. Uh, I, I actually, even as I thought about finding your way, a book that we've written, we, 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 we understand that each person is unique and they have this opportunity to have impact. And I think that's great. I think that's true. But the flip side of that coin, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about lately, actually, I've read a book recently called Range. It's written by a guy named David Epstein, you probably don't know who David Epstein is, but he was a, a at one time a writer for Sports Illustrated. He's the guy who actually broke the PED scandal for Alex Rodriguez uh, back a few years ago. And David Epstein's written a book called Range, and in his book Range, his subtitle I think is pretty fascinating. It's it's how generalists triumph in a specialized world. And so David Epstein is going to take on the University of North Carolina admissions counselor by by lobbying that we have more of a almost renaissance mindset rather than a specialist mindset, a, a, a mindset where we are, we are more well-rounded. We're able to handle situations. And it's a fascinating book. He, he talks about some things in there that are uh, pretty familiar to all of us. We, he just a couple of weeks ago, you know, old Tiger Woods was in a uh, car wreck and he uses him as one of the first stories in the book. He talks about how Tiger Woods was, was, it was, ingrained in him really almost he became a robot at two years old all the way up and you would be hard pressed to argue that Tiger Woods hadn't had an amazing golf career he's he's so focused so great he talks about chess champions who are so focused and maniacal almost about their training and and just really um almost out of balance in uh, one specific area and it's true that some of the people who have had the most impact really are out of balance, really are focused. We talk about focus, how important that is, having that target, having that bullseye. There's a lot of truth to that. But I think sometimes at what cost? I think if we're not careful, we can become so focused on one thing that we can lose sight of the people around us, the other opportunities we have to grow and develop, and ultimately we can stunt our our growth as human beings um, – at the, at the expense of just being really good at one thing or really great at one thing, uh, we might even say. So I want us to think about this today. I want us to have a little bit of a conversation. One of the things Epstein talks about is he, he, he goes into this whole uh, youth sports thing. He talks about how today we have parents that want their kids to be Olympians someday. And, 
he, 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 he gives a couple of good examples. He says, uh, we, we have parents who are expecting their kids to do at six, seven, 10 years old, what Olympians are doing rather than asking themselves, what were the Olympians doing when they were six, seven, 10 years old? And the truth is the best athletes, the, the people who are the most impactful in different sports, really a lot of them grew up playing multiple sports. They didn't just do travel baseball 100 games a year or a part of a soccer team that was playing every day 11 months a year, take you know a little one month off season, then they got 60 games and training all the time. Those things are great. And uh, truthfully, it, the people who make the national team, a lot of those kids do that. But the reality is most of us are not, and I say, I say almost every one of us are not going to make the national team. We're not going to be Tiger Woods when it comes to, to golf. And there are a lot of professionals who, who were well-rounded. You start talking to the vast majority of people who are professional golfers or professional athletes in any uh, of the sports, and you'll find that they actually were multifaceted in their training and their approach. Uh, a lot of times the, the people who are very mathematical and scientific in their thinking, they're also good in music. They have, there's just well-roundedness to them. So I want you to think about that a little bit this week. I don't know if anybody's challenged you lately. Do you have something beyond your something that is that is challenging to think about it? Now, I want to bring in our our uh, our old buddy uh, Chuck Cusimano here. He'll, he'll be new to uh, – to, to some of you, but some of you know Chuck, and and uh, he's one of the coaches on our team. He's he's one of the best business leaders in in the country, really, in his thinking. Such a great sales and marketing thinker. He's such a great consultant as well, and has added so much value. Uh, he's the first guy that I that I when I needed somebody to help me, he was the first guy I called years ago, and and uh, Chuck has been uh, a great partner in in our work. But he's also been a great partner in my thinking. Is is I'm around every time I'm around him, I'm always coming away with different thoughts. He's got so many ideas and things. And so we're having this conversation a few years ago, and I remember Chuck comes up with this idea. Um, in fact, I'll bring you in here, Chuck. You're the first person who who gave me this idea that great is not not always about being an expert in only one area. Uh, I think the way you said it was how cool would it would it be if you could be great at being good in several areas? That was what you were known for. I was like, you're great at being good in, in so many other things. So in, in other words, uh, to have all these areas that you're good at, to be so well-rounded that you're comfortable in every situation. I think the executive level leaders that are a part of our show and even the young leaders who are, who are thinking about their career, uh, Chuck, the, almost this renaissance mindset. Can you talk to us about that and, and your idea about being – uh, great at being good in several different things. Talk to us about that, if you will. Sure. I think um, I would say it's more like becoming specialists versus generalists. Um, that might be another way of saying it. Or you could just say you want to be great at being good at a lot of things. Um, and not a lot of people have been taught to do that. That's kind of like Henry Ford's assembly line, <clears throat> where we were trained from an efficiency standpoint to do one thing over and over and get really good at it, maybe even great at it, and then you'll be great at that one thing. The problem is if you're really great at putting on the tires on a car, does that help you later on to be great at running Ford Motor Company? And the answer probably is no, because you are so specialized in just tires, you don't understand the engines or some other things. So that's really where this generalist versus specialist come in. And I think that um, has a lot more to do with leadership as well. The more of a general knowledge you have on more disciplines and you can talk and interact with more people, um, the easier it is for you to matriculate through an organization because you have much more of an understanding of the whole picture of things. I really believe that the more you can pursue things that are similar or maybe very divergent from each other, but that you're more well-rounded, the better leader you are, um, I think the better person you are because you can then interact with more people and you become much more empathetic. And empathy is one of those skills that doesn't get used as much as I think it should in today's world. Being empathetic really helps in a leadership capacity and just as being a good human being. The third thing I think about when I'm talking or I'm thinking of this idea of being good at a lot of things and maybe not being great at any one thing is it allows you to take 
ideas from different disciplines and cross-pollinate those. And we can talk about that a little bit later when we talk about consulting, but you know, we call it the bumblebee effect in that you're just going from one plant to the next and you're taking the pollen and you're cross-pollinating so they all um, get better. And I think being good in a lot of things or having an appetite for being good in a lot of things really helps with that cross-pollinization. If you think about Steve Jobs, um, sure, he started out with computers and electronics, but he wasn't the greatest at it. Um, he was good in design, maybe better than average. He was good in electronics, but he got fired from Apple, um, his own company, when he first started it. Then he left, um, started another company, and then he went to Pixar and helped them. And I think when he came back is when he truly hit his greatness because he could take this ability to be really good in a lot of diverse fields and he pulled them all together and that's what made Apple great. If you think about, um, it's crazy, there's this guy, I think his name's Dean Carmen, and he invented the Segway, you know, a little scooter you, you lean forward on. But he also invented the, um, the pump for um, intravenous drugs. You're like, what do those two have anything to do with each other? And they don't. Um, uh, Lear Jets, you know, I heard a story about the guy, Bill Lear, and he started off with biplanes and then he thought, well, doesn't everybody need a plane? And he invented the Lear Jet, but he also was a co-founder um, of the first car radio. And he is actually the person that invented the eight-track cassette tape. So you'd think, what does an eight-track cassette tape have to do with a Lear Jet? And the only thing they have to do with each other is it's the same man. And I think that's because he's just so well-rounded. He was taking ideas from one industry and just cross-pollinating them to another. All right. So, so as you think about uh, some of the things he talked about there, and even if you think about your own life, do you have a, a comfort level in, in more than one arena? Are you comfortable outside of work? Not, and, and when I say outside of work, outside of your specific role. Now, you may be a, a person who has a task. There are people who are listening. You have a task right now, and you're, you, you don't have a department, and you don't have, you know, maybe you don't have a company or, or something that you're leading. Maybe you're just, you're just in the grind. And yet some of you here are, um, you're, you're maybe here today, and you do have a department, or you do have a company all of a sudden, and yet you find yourself staying in the grind of what you're really comfortable with. I think if we're not careful, we can lose this um, this this ability to think generally. Just we're, we're so specific that we can almost live in the weeds. And the next thing you know, if we're doing that, we find ourselves all the time just just buried in details. We micromanage a lot of times. We don't have a, an ability to pull back and and to really think about things broadly. And so I want to I want to challenge you this week to make some time to set aside and just say, okay, let me think about, like, almost like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, let me think about some areas that I need to think broadly. And maybe you need to have a hobby. Maybe you need to have some activities you do, some recreation, what, whatever it is. I, I want to challenge you to really pull back and say, Am I, have I become too pointed? I think there's, there's power in being pointed at times, but also think if we're not careful, we can become so pointed that we're not emotionally aware of what's going on with the people around us, we can be so focused on results that we can lose those relationships, some of those kind of things. So there's some things that you you probably need to apply as you begin to think about this idea of having range, being able to, to generalize a little bit in this specific world. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull Chuck back in. And, and Chuck, I'm going to ask you to put on your coach's hat for a minute. Uh, you know, we've coached so many executives over the last few years, and, and some of them, as you know, are struggling – because they've neglected what we're talking about here. Uh, they're really good at a specific role, let's say operations, uh, and yet they get promoted into a leadership position, and some of them find it hard to think broadly. Um, we've seen and work with some leaders who, when we started working with them, they kept slip, slipping back into the weeds like I've been talking about here. So uh, if somebody's struggling, who, who, somebody's listening here and they're struggling with, with, with that micromanaging mindset or that pulling back into the weeds, how can we how can we encourage them to pull back up and broaden their perspective? Can you speak to that for a second? Yeah, it's very unfortunate that a lot of us have gone up one discipline or another through a company, whether it be sales or um, operations. It could be accounting. Uh, it could be general administration, and we kind of get siloed because we're really good at that one thing. And because we're good at it, 
we get promoted, so we put more time and effort at it and we get better at it. And then when we get near the top, um, when we're talking about you know higher levels of management and leadership, that's when they start saying, well, does Mary or does Bob have any idea on accounting? I mean, how can we have them run the business if they don't know the, the P&L or the balance sheet? Uh, or somebody's in sales and they go, well, sure, they can sell, but you know, do they really know anything about operations and production? Um, or worse yet, we may even say as an organization, well, they're so good at the one thing they do, we can't afford to leave them there, let them leave there so they can't get promoted. So sometimes being that specialist, being really good at that one thing um, holds us back in so many other ways in our career. And usually when we get involved, as you brought up in this question, um, from a coaching standpoint, if somebody is moving up and, you know, maybe they're uh, the head of operations and usually operations, you know, you have to be pretty good at holding people accountable. You have to be pretty tough um, on the system because in operations, it's always more and more and more, um, faster, 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 cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And we're always looking for more efficiency. But then when you get up to that C-level suite, um, they don't want you to be so hard charging. They want you to be a little more user-friendly. They want you to be a little nicer to the people. Um, and not that you weren't before, but it's, it's a different mindset. And a lot of executives have gotten stuck there because they know how to do the one thing they do really well. And now all of a sudden, this late in their career, they're asked to cross over and, and now be this generalist. So I think the more we can be a generalist as we come up through an organization, the better off we will be. Plus, I just think it makes you a more interesting person. If, if all you do is one thing all day long, it doesn't make you very interesting. And if you're not very interesting, you're not usually that um, likable. And if you're not that likable, then you're usually not going to go anywhere. That's great. Great stuff there. So I want to challenge you to pick one of those things that Chuck shared and just say, can I pull back and can I pick one thing and 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 really think uh, more broadly. And, and then I would give you one other thing I would add to that. I want to challenge you to take 30 minutes and put it on your calendar in the next couple of days before the weekend. I just pull back and say, if I, if I took 30 minutes to just really pull back with some perspective time, let's take 30 minutes and say, what's it like to be on my team? What's, what's, person A or person B or just anybody list all the people and ask yourself, what's this person going through this week? And as you begin to identify just maybe one bullet point on each one, Stan's going through this and Samantha's going through that and Carol's got this and Bob's got this. And as you begin to write those names down and here's what they're going through, is there, is there the ability that you have to speak into their need? Do you, do you think generally, or have you just begun to think so specific only about the goal or only about the, the priority. Those things are great. They're very important. But if you lose sight of the people, you're going to have a hard time uh, being great, really, or helping others be great. And re remember, gre chasing greatness is about helping others be great. So uh, I want to challenge you to, to pick an area and say, I'm going to focus on my people. I'm going to ask myself what they're going through, and I'm going to see if I can bring a little bit more perspective to the conversation than maybe what I've had lately. Maybe there's something there for you. As you think about that. So uh, while I got uh, while we got Chuck today, uh, Chuck, you know, we've been doing this series the last few weeks on chasing greatness. And I have watched you uh, for years continually grow uh, and improve. I mean, you're an older guy like me, but you just keep trying to get better and keep uh, working on yourself. Uh, as we think about this idea of chasing greatness, can you speak to how you personally define greatness like what would you say uh from your perspective like what does greatness mean to you it's funny you asked me that question uh, how do i define greatness uh, one of the things that usually i spend a lot of time on when i'm coaching someone is definitions just what do you actually mean by that because we all throw words out there and most of the time in communication i found it's not that we can't communicate, we just can't uh, even agree on the basic form of what we're asking someone to do. If someone says, hey, I want you to put in a hard day's work, hard day's work means one thing to one person and something totally different to another. So when you ask me a question, well, you know, how do I define greatness? Th that's the most important thing is what is the definition of greatness? And I think that's um, unique for each individual. I think greatness is that rare air, as you would say, um, to where very few other people can actually participate at a level that you do or at least be as good as you are. So you can be great 
at being good at a lot of things. And that sounds like I'm playing a trick there, but some people are great at you know, kicking a football or some people are great at making money or starting new companies. Some people are great at um, helping people, putting out fires, whatever that may be. But what if you were great at being the master of a lot of things, you know, the jack of all trades? And that I think is highly valued. It was years ago when people were on farms and they had to figure out how to fix a lot of things because you couldn't just run down to the store. But now in our more modern society, we're trying to become more and more efficient and efficiency comes when you just do one thing over and over and it's very repetitive um, and it burns people out as well. So I think greatness is the ability for you to change and morph yourself to whatever the situation calls for. I think there's a lot of wonderful examples of people who are chasing greatness and are becoming great. You know, in the last year, COVID-19 has stretched most of us into areas that we don't normally apply ourselves. I look at some of the greatest people right now are those stay-at-home moms and, and dads that before they just did one thing and they did it really well. They got up, they got dressed, they went to work, they generated a good living for themselves and created a great environment for others to work. And they came home and they did a few other um, meaningful, wonderful things. But now, um, during the day, they're becoming, um, you know, the math teacher, the science teacher, the, hey, let's go out and do a science experiment if they have kids, the, how do I become great at a Zoom call or something like that. So I think there's a lot of great examples where people have been stretched in this last year to become things that they never knew they could become. And that's a good example for all of us that we have way more potential inside us than we really know of. The world has told us to be really focused on one thing, but sometimes when we focus on more than one thing, we actually um, use that, that ability to cross-pollinate and become better at all the things. Okay, that, that's so awesome. Uh, let's, let's take it a step further, Chuck. Can you give us some things that we can do, some practices, maybe routines or habits that you've built into your life and leadership as you've attempted to maximize your potential, what are some things that we can, we I always, I always love learning from other leaders. What are some habits, routines, practices, things you do to, to really chase greatness in your own life, try to maximize your potential? Give us some, th some things that we can do here. Sure. When we're coaching, one of the first things we look at is what routines have people developed, what routines are in their lives. And I find that the, the more people have routines that are well planned and well thought out, um, usually the more effective they are in achieving the things they're going after. For a lot of us, we have some habits and they're good habits, some may be bad habits, um, but that to me is the very beginning of something. A habit is something that you do uh, most of the time, but you don't necessarily have to do it. And if you form habits um, and many habits in a row then become a routine, some of you have a routine when you get up in the morning, how you prepare for work, how you drive to work, how you get into the office or however you do that. Uh, and then when we really get those routines down and they become in a certain order and we're very methodical about them, you could almost take that to the next point, which is called a ritual. And a ritual is really just a routine, but it's done in a very precise order. And for most people, if you could get to that level, not all day long, it's a ritual, just certain things you do, it really helps build a muscle memory on how you do things and how you go about that. So the problem is sometimes we're in a groove, right? And then all of a sudden we end up in a rut. And we say, well, how do we go from a groove to a rut? Well, by definition, a rut is just a groove that's been driven on too many times and that's how you get a rut. It's like a pothole. They always say, why, why are the potholes always, you know, in the worst part of the road where I want to drive? Well, that's because everybody's driving there. That's what creates the pothole. So in our lives, I think we do that. For me, I, I struggle with this convergence of creativity and productivity. So the way I try to work it out is I get up in the morning and usually I allow myself to be as creative as possible before I do anything else. I just get up, I come in, and if there's something on my mind from when I was sleeping, I'll just you know write about that, just get it out of my head. I might just talk into a tape recorder and I might sketch something out. So that's one of the things I do. Then I go through um, a routine um, and a ritual um, more so because I use a, a daily planner and I go through and I map out my entire day. I looked at it the night before and I know exactly what I'm doing. I fill in the blanks and all those spots and I give myself time to do the things I want to. And for me, I'm a check the box kind of guy some of the time. So I'll have areas where I check the box. And then one of my checking the box is, hey, take 30 minutes and read something. 
um, be creative. You know, I might go work on something. Um, I like to do woodworking, or I might just think of a project and think at all, uh, think of all the different steps. So I actually give myself time to do all those things. And I think that's for a lot of people, we get so busy and we're tied up in the busyness that we're not actually being productive in areas that we want. So to be, to wrap it all up in, in a well-roundedness, you have to force yourself or be very intentional about giving yourself time to do those things that allow you to be more well-rounded. Maybe it's writing thank you notes, maybe it is reading, maybe it's watching something, maybe it's creating something. But if you'll give yourself time to do those, then I think you'll be much more successful. And you, you know, I think you'll have a, a much more um, fulfilling life because you're not just one dimensional. One of the things that has seemed to work the best for a lot of clients myself included, is this idea of emotional intelligence, practicing the skills that help you to be more emotionally intelligent. Another way of putting it is how agile or adaptable are you um, to other people and other, and other situations? Because in today's world, it changes very quickly. And although you may be good at one thing, can you regulate your emotions? Can you understand the emotions of those around you? And can you come up with solutions and systems and processes that allow all that to flow together? I guess another way of putting emotional intelligence is what are your people skills? You know, how are you um, good at that? So one of the practices we try to do is to just understand other people. It's practicing empathy. And I think the, the leaders and the people that have the ability to be more empathetic to see others uh, and what they're going through, not just to see it through the lens of what it is about themselves, um, tend to be the ones that move quicker through organizations, have better leadership skills, and overall just um, feel more happy and joyful in life because they're more adapted to other human beings around them. Unless you're in a job where you can work by yourself all day long, most of us have to interact with other people, and the skill and the ability to interact effectively with other people really, I think, um, is what leads a lot of people to personal greatness. How well do you live and work with those around you okay that's awesome so i want to challenge you to pick one of those things that chuck's doing try something new this week to say okay what can i do to to really maximize my potential i've watched chuck as i said continue to grow through the years and i think one of the reasons is because he's been committed to growing he's been trying to learn as he goes and so if if you want to be great Again, let's go back to where we started the conversation today. Let's make sure that we have some range. We don't become so pointed that we can lose. There's a difference in being pointed and being sharp. I think sharp is where we are able to bring range to our conversations. We are well-rounded. We're aware of what's going on with the people around us. And we're really trying to not just do the right thing when it comes to our job, but we're really trying to be the right person for those we lead and for those on our team. And so we're going we're gonna to follow this conversation up. I had a conversation uh, recently with a young leader who's really asking, like, how do I, how do I work myself into where I want to be in my career? And so we got some things that we'll build on today's conversation. But one of the things I think we can do to prepare is we can bring range to that conversation to think more as a generalist in a specialized world. It does not war against focus. We have to have focus. We have to understand. We have priority in our life. But but one of the priorities, or maybe the priority, is to make sure that we are well-rounded. We're not so pointed that we alienate everybody around us, especially if we want to have great impact on the people in our lives. So let's, uh, let's live this week and let's chase uh, greatness. But one of the ways we can do it is just by by having more range, being able to go left and right like a ball player or being able to have re results and relationships in business. So think about that this week. Make sure you, uh, that, you, that you continue to develop your range. Uh, thanks for listening. I encourage you to share with a friend. Uh, if you need to connect with Chuck, reach out. We'll get you connected to him as well. And if there's any way we can help you, we'd love to do that. Make sure this week you are found chasing greatness. We'll see you next week.